Radyak. You're listening to Ad Yak. Ad Yak is the official podcast of the AAF Greater Lehigh Valley Ad Club. Our mission is to inspire creativity and enhance the professional development of the advertising and marketing communities where we live and work. I'm your host, Bill Childs, and I'll talk with artists, designers, writers, directors, photographers, along with those who work in a creative capacity. Our aim here is to serve as a creative resource to help you stay informed, entertained, and above all, inspired. But first, I want to thank ASR Media. We appreciate your support and collaboration. Welcome to Adyak. I am so thrilled to have this next guest on the podcast, Tony Vengrove. Tony is a marketing veteran with over 25 years experience driving innovation at two of New York City's global ad agencies, Gray Advertising and Saatchi and & Saatchi. Tony experienced daily exactly how creativity gets used to drive everything from client pitches brand strategies, messaging, design, and media placement. But on the other hand, he also witnessed how easy it was for anyone to kill a transformative idea, which led him to do a thought-provoking TED Talk titled Give Ideas a Chance. During his agency years, he's worked with some incredible brands like Pepperidge Farms, Ultra Slim Fast, and Tough Actin, Tin Actin, along with Litchfield Distillery and Create a Castle, a 2020 Toy of the Year award winner that allows anyone to build amazing sandcastles in minutes. Continuing his creative journey, he formed Miles Finch Innovation, a marketing and innovation consultancy, where he is a sought-after advisor for marketing and strategy advice for businesses and nonprofits across multiple industries. My conversation with Tony revealed a deep working knowledge and zen-like comprehension of how creativity works and why it matters. Tony and I yak it up on topics ranging from how business leaders must better manage their creative teams to his keen understanding of how to set up a creative culture inside a business. Tony's a deep thinker, an explorer, and a dreamer. And as you'll learn after listening to our conversation, why I think he might just be my brother from another mother. So here is my ad yak with Tony Vengrove. Okay, here we are. Tony Vengrove. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great, Bill. Good, great to see you. And thanks for having me on the podcast here. Welcome to ad yak. So we're going to get into some cool stuff here. Um, I'm real excited to talk to you. Um, because I think uh, we share a topic that is near and dear to both of our hearts, and that's creative leadership. Uh, but before we do that, I want you to just walk me through your your work life. You know your you know your career, some of the places you've worked and things you've done. I began my career at Gray Advertising and Saatchi and Saatchi, focused on the account management side and some big New York agencies. A few years into that, I got kind of uh, the bug to jump to the other side. And I joined a few kind of corporate companies and marketing roles and ended my corporate career as a director of innovation. I had kind of the whole marketing communication side and had a lot of strategic uh, planning and a lot of leading innovation in a big kind of uh, global corporate environment. 10 years ago, I decided a little tired of the, the corporate rat race. So I started my own consulting firm. So I've been doing that for 10 years. I'm here in Connecticut and most of my clients today are located here in the state. Okay. What's the name of the, what's the name of your firm? Uh, it's called Miles Finch Innovation. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Did, um, did you enjoy your time at Saatchi? I did. It was fun because, you know, Gray was a great agency and at the time known for probably being a little bit more strategic. You know, we won a lot of Effie awards and I really wanted to win something more creative and the spot opened up right when Pepperidge Farm was kind of retiring uh, Pepperidge Farm remembers and the old farmer. You remember that old oh, camp yeah. that I grew up on? And so we were tasked with bringing all the sub brands to life. So they didn't want to do kind of a big master brand anymore. They wanted to kind of really drive the equity of Milano cookies and, and oh, okay. goldfish. It was just like, it, it was almost easy, Bill. You know, it was just because <laughs> we were the first people to go in and do find all these great insights about these iconic brands and bring them to life and really kind of fresh and fun ways. And, and it just, you know, the sales just went through the roof. It was really, really, really fun time. Well, you, you, um, you have a lot to say about the topic of creative leadership. So I want to, I want to start there. What, sure. what, um, let's just start with, what is it? What do you, what do you see as creative leadership? What, what, what is it? What does it mean? To you. When people ask me that question, I, I always 
I start by uh, uh, sharing a, a Warren Bennis quote, and I'm a big fan of his leadership writing. And he once said, there's two ways of being creative. One can sing and dance, or you can create the conditions in which singers and dancers flourish. I can't come up with a definition that's really better than that because it's really the latter. It's really about leading people so that creativity can flourish in your organization. Rather than being the person with all these solutions and the answers, you're kind of cr creating a bigger collective brain that's kind of aligned around a broader vision and, and objectives. And they're, you know, they're fired up to kind of go delivered against all that. So well, really I, the creative yeah. leader, I'm sorry, the creative leader is the person that's creating that culture. Yes, and I, I want to get your opinion on this uh, quote uh, from Yvonne Kinsner that I, I just recently came upon, upon, and I thought, wow, I want to see what you think about this. It's, she said, innovation is not a process, but a state of mind. Therefore, it can't be learned, but felt. And I wonder how you, how you feel about that. I, I agree with that in principle. I, I, you know, to be honest with you, I think innovation you know, there's so many de definitions of innovation that it kind of muddies the water and only, right. almost be, at time feels like this kind of silly mystical thing. <laughs> um, and, and I really describe innovation as capturing value from ideas. And that way, you know, it can be a system within a business. It can be a new product. It can be almost anything. I agree that it's a feeling, but a little bit more, it feels like about creativity, that there's something there, there's a better way of doing something. There's kind of like a drive behind creativity, which kind of comes back to creative leadership. If the people aren't kind of fired up to go find a novel solution to something, then you're probably going to end up with something average. Well, you gave, um, you gave a TED talk uh, that I watched and I just, uh, I loved it. I, I, I would recommend everyone who's listening to this uh, watch it uh, when we're done here and we'll get into, I'll, I'll leave that link, uh, you know, when we, when we're finished. Um, but the one thing that I, that I really, there's a lot that you said in there that I like, but the one thing I love is that you said, if you believe it, you will see it. Right. As opposed to what most people say is I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah. I, it talk to me a little bit more mm -hmm. about, about that and what that means to you. Well, you know, I can't t really take credit for that philosophy that kind of spiritual folks have written about for eons. You have to be open to seeing new things. It kind of opens up your eyes, your heart, your brain to kind of look. If you believe it, you will see it. It comes back to creative leadership. People want to be in that kind of culture doing that kind of work. Yeah, I just think it's, um, you know, I, I I had an experience. I, I spoke about this uh and I think with you at one point about uh, when I worked at Adams Outdoor Advertising, the two years that I was there and the leader there had a wonderful approach to how he looked at, at his role within the company. Now, he was the general manager. He was in charge of everything, but he had this upside down pyramid approach to his role. He saw himself at the bottom of the pyramid supporting everyone else, mm -hmm. right? Not what you would traditionally think of, which is the pyramid and then the leader at the top right? With everyone else in the organization pushing up and supporting that leader. And I just, I love that as a mindset because it just, it just put him in a place where he was vulnerable. He knew he didn't have all the ideas. He trusted the people that he hired to do what they needed to do. And he created a culture, an environment that allowed for people to explore and, 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 and swim in that, in that soup, if you will, of just, Hey, we're on the search for big ideas here. That's yeah. what we're about. And it, it could come from anybody. He did, yeah. It didn't have to come from him. In fact, he'd prefer that it didn't come from him. And most times when he was in the meetings, he always sat in the back. He never sat at the table. And he, he did more listening than he did talking. But one of the cool things was, you might remember this old commercial from many, many years ago, E.F. Hutton, when someone would say to, hey, hey, John, what do you think? The room would just turn and just wait. And he would always work the pregnant pause. He would never just like fire off. He would just pause, collect his thoughts. And it was always something brilliant. It was never just like something off the cuff or it, it just, and I just, I loved his approach of the upside down pyramid, you know, of just creating that environment and not, not, uh, not stigmatizing mistakes, you know, mm -hmm. not, not um, making people, you know, giving permission for people to fail or have bad ideas. You know, we, uh, why is it always every time, like, you know, you look at a creative director and, and it's like, you know, 
the creative director doesn't have to be the person that always comes up with all the good ideas. They're the person that that's setting the the tone and the environment to allow everyone else to come up with those ideas. Yeah. They're ultimately responsible for what idea gets maybe picked and worked on, but you know, you build that coalition and teamwork when you allow everyone to to contribute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in my Saatchi days, there was a headache medicine. The line was like pain spoken here or something. Through my father as a mentor who was on the creative side, I had advice on how to deal with creatives and kind of get their trust and earn their trust and all that kind of stuff. So I, um, so uh, we were approaching the holidays and, and we were doing uh, Christmas commercials for Pepper's Farm. And, and so I had Christmas commercials on, on, on my brain. And I thought about that campaign, a waitress holding a huge tray of dishes and stuff. You could feel the pain and the image. I was friends with the art director and I said, hey, have you guys thought about doing a holiday ad? Why don't you get Santa trying to climb down the chimney with a huge sack of uh, toys? Right. And, um, and I left it at that. And shortly thereafter, I, I, I kind of left the agency. And to this credit, uh, John tracked me down to call me like a year later to let me know that they never forgot that idea. And they, um, um, uh, they ended up doing a print ad with the whole Santa Claus thing. And I was just like so moved and touched that this guy would like go through this effort of trying to track me down and, and call me in my office at this company. And, and I think that's a great sign that there's good creative leadership and a great creative culture, because, you know, I'm sure you've faced this bill where people say just because of your role, you can't participate in the idea creation. And, right. uh, and that's just absurd to me. So, you yeah, know, I mean, you know, companies today, they're, they're looking for, for these, for these ways you know, to, uh, to be innovative or just to just, and they yeah. just, they miss the mark. They just yeah, miss yeah, yeah. it. And, and I, I, I can't figure out why. I mean, I have some theories. Creative leadership in a company it is needed. I think there's an inherent business reason you need to solve problems. I once went through training with an amazing gentleman named uh, Dr. Gerald Bell. He was out of University of North Carolina. He was a leadership mentor to basketball coaches and uh, basketball players, as well as corporations. And he had this theory, law of 100 problems. His philosophy on this was, Every day you wake up and you have a hundred problems. And to me, solving a problem is a creative endeavor. Absolutely. Um, so I think that's like one reason why you need creative leadership to create an army in your company that is good at solving problems, good at feeding their brain with information and data, and then can kind of sit back and connect dots and fix a problem. So I think that's one core reason. I think the other reason is probably more kind of like a human reason. And it's because we're creators. I think everybody comes to work and they want to put their own unique fingerprint on something. A company's creativity is one of its hugest assets and you're not going to really find it on the balance sheet. It's up to management to kind of extract all that value. I don't know if you'll agree. Maybe you will. Uh, I think ego plays a big uh, role in this because there's, a, <laughs> not sure if you're aware of this, a lot of ego in this business. A lot of ego in the creative business, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I have found, at least, you know, in my work career, I've experienced it a, a lot. But also the, 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 the higher up you go and the people that are, are more comfortable in their, in their skills and what, they're, what they bring to the table, mm -hmm. the ego is actually less. So it, it's almost like it just feels like to me, like people who are, um, you know, maybe still kind of uh, not comfortable with, with their own skill set and what they bring to the table, I think ego kind of works its way in there. You know, I've just found that uh, when you take ego out of the equation, it, great things can happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's another, that's another thing that a leader has to, a creative leader has to, has to manage that, has to manage the egos, you know, not make it about them. You know, uh, what's that old, what's that old, I think it might be Drucker that says, uh, you know, the failures are the leaders, the successes are the teams. Especially senior roles at bigger corporations. It's such a demanding job that to get there really requires people that are really grounded. So I, I you know, I agree with you that I, I've always been really impressed with a lot of the senior leaders that I've been surrounded by because, and not a hundred percent, but in the majority of cases, they are, the, the ego isn't there that you might see in some more of the kind of the 
the mid management and, mm-hmm. and between the CEO and, and kind of director level. Um, and I think that's because the only way you can get there these days is you can't have a huge ego because you can't do it all. You know, um, yeah. the company is too big and complicated to be able to uh, to have all the answers. Not, not to mention the fact it's one of the most powerful things. You know, if you're in a meeting and, you know, everyone's looking to that one person who's supposed to have all the ideas and that person is like, you know what? I don't really know a lot about that. Why don't, yeah. you, why don't you tell me about that? Why don't you educate me? You know, how many people are comfortable doing that? How many people are comfortable openly saying that in a meeting that, that they're supposed to either be leading or they're the, they're the, you know, the account person, the top person on the account, you know, to me, that's refreshing and, you know, requires a little bit of vulnerability on someone's part, to, but, and you got to be confident in your own, in who you are to be able to say, I don't know everything I should know about that. Why don't, why don't you, why don't you help me? And boy, do you, can you see the room change when that happens? My last corporate job was down in Richmond, Virginia. And when I finally got settled down there, I started having meetings with my new team. So they got to the end and there was like this pregnant pause and they were just kind of looking, waiting for me to just kind of like hold court and just be like, love it, hate it, whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what do you guys think? What are you guys most passionate about? And they kind of, Oh man, I love that. That's great. And and they said, no, I kid you not. God's honest truth. They said, nobody's asked us that before. Not surprised. (laughs) And, um, and so I, I learned so much from that one meeting about like how I needed to lead this group because they needed to be empowered. They needed to know that I trusted them and, and I wanted them, you know, I was going to stick my neck out for them and and they loved me for it, you know? Yeah. I, I have a similar, uh, I remember again, Adams, I was being tasked by Don to run a weekly creative session. Okay. I had never run a creative session. I, I didn't even know what, what they were. I said, okay, that's cool. I said, so every week he's like, yep, every week. I said, all right. Um, So what happens in a creative session, right? And this is what I love about this answer. Listen to this answer. He says, well, that's for you to figure out. And I was like, "Mm." ownership, right? Giving me the ownership. Now, remember, he's the general manager of the company. He could have said, oh, I have a binder of stuff that I want you to cover uh, in the order that I want you to cover it. Uh, This came from corporate. We're going to do this, you know. I would have been just like, you know, I would have been lost. But he said this, he said, but here's what I want the outcome to be. Okay. However, you're going to get there. This is the outcome that I want. I want the account executives to be able to speak intelligently about the power of good design. Hmm. Oh, hmm. I could do that. Yep. That's what they're supposed to. That's what the creative session is supposed to be, Bill. And I said, Great. all right. And he said, and I'm going to be in all, all of them because I, they're important. And I want people to know that they're important. So I will be in every one, but you, you will be running it. You will be in charge. And however you decide to attack that challenge, I just want the reps to, when they're sitting in front of clients and a, and a, and a design comes over their, you know, you know, under their nose or in front of their face, I want them to be able to talk about what, what, maybe how the design can be improved before it gets to you guys. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's all I want. And that's what we did for two years. I ran the creative sessions for two years and there were things in there where, you know, I remember doing things like um, uh, I, we read poetry by candlelight, um, you know, not the obvious stuff, you know what uh-huh. I mean? Um, brought magicians in, uh, looked at looked at what good creative obviously looked like, what bad creative looks like, you know, and talked about it, talked about, uh, typography and, um, you know, fonts and how fonts can have personalities. Just, I just yeah. filled their heads with all this kind of stuff that, you know, and, and they loved it. Demonstrates the power of a great objective. The best success stories that I've been involved in had a great creative brief, a great objective. I, I'm a firm believer in, in leading by objective. It's just, it's, it's a great way to get great work out of people, but it's also the, the perfect way to judge work without deflating people. But that feedback yeah. enables them to come up with an idea that is on strategy. Hey, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of plan B and plan C. Sometimes mm-hmm. those plans actually end up being better than what the initial plan was. I mean, plans as it relates to what the creative ends up being, yeah. not the not this you know the strategy. But talk to me about. I know there's a story you have you shared um, 
on your TED talk. I, I want to hear have you talk about it here. The cold medicine. <laughs> Yeah, the cold medicine, which I thought was like, yeah, just brilliant on your part when the insight you had. But tell, yeah. talk to me about so that. So this was early on in my career. In fact, I was actually in between Gray and Saatchi at a, a small agency down so called Warwick Baker and Fiore that's no longer in existence. We were working on the Drixoral cold medicine. What I was doing for the first time in my career, ethnography research, which was really interesting, you know, really in-depth consumer research to get at really emotional insights. We found ourselves in the agency's conference room. I was the most junior person. And then there was like all the way up to head of strategy of the whole agency. We're in there with stuff all over the walls, depicting all these different kind of insights and trying to build off of them and get some creative strategy stuff. I really felt compelled to speak up because I realized everything we were talking about was really from the perspective of the of the consumer, the cold suffer, which makes sense because that's all the research that we did. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, and I can't remember uh, so long ago, but for some reason I said to myself, well, what if we flip that and looked at this through the perspective of the, of the virus or the, the, the cold? And in doing so, all of a sudden the brand becomes their worst enemy. And maybe that would be kind of a fresh way to kind of do something different. And the creative mm -hmm. team would like kind of you know, do something kind of really kind of fun and clever and new. And so, so I said it and the room went quiet and everybody kind of looked over to Susan. She went and got, Hmm, that's interesting. But she basically kind of gave some rational answer that kind of poo pooed the idea. And then we went back to all the other stuff. Not too long after that, and not because of that incident, I, I moved on to Saatchi and, uh, no, actually I went, I moved back to gray, um, before I went to Saatchi and, um, and so I'm driving in my car, listening to WFAN, a sports station up here. Lo and behold, a radio commercial for Drixoral comes on, and it's the exact same strategy, the personification of the cold. No way. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that is freaking great. You know, I was like, I wasn't upset or mad. I was just like, I was excited. So and they so I called, came to that conclusion themselves. Anyway. Yeah. So I, I called up... Um, this guy Carl, who was on the you know the the writer, and uh, and we reconnected, and 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 it's a great story because the thing I love about it is like when there's a nugget of idea, like they kept it alive. To me, that's a, another insight related to creative leadership. Sometimes you need the right people to really go from good to great with it. Right, right. Um, can you talk a little bit uh, to me with me about your idea climate equation? Sure, sure. As I was beginning my own little consulting firm, my wife bought me a book by John Hunt called The Art of the Idea. And I'm a huge fan of that, that book and I highly recommend it. I'm reading chapter five and chapter five is called Logic is Kryptonite. And after reading that chapter, um, you know, and it's all about how, you know, logic can kill like any idea if it's introduced too early in an idea, you know, it's just going to mm -hmm. suffocate it and anybody can pull off any kind of data or history yep. and, and come up with a reason why the idea doesn't work. And so that chapter kind of, I, I just came up with this equation, idea climate, which is essentially kind of the climate or culture of your, of, of your company is equal to creativity raised to the power of belief divided by logic raised to the power of doubt. So really all it, it does, it's not an equation meant to like plug in numbers and get a score. Mm -hmm. It's really meant to visualize and get people to understand like why creativity in a corporate environment or many environment for that matter, is so difficult to deal with, especially in corporations, they're addicted to logic. So the first thing the equation does is just make it easier for people to understand like that dynamic lives with us every single day uh, of our existence. And we have to like acknowledge it and create the space for creativity. Otherwise it's just gonna get sm smothered. The other components are the two exponents, um, belief and doubt. And we've already talked about belief, but to me, belief is such a catalyst. Like if you can get people really engaged with your vision, with the objectives, you know, conveying the sense that whatever problem is so important to solve, you know, it's just going to fuel creativity at that kind of exponential power. And the same thing holds true for doubt. That's kind of the fundamental of it. Those four variables are all important. It's not like any of them are better than the other. It really comes down to when 
or where you are in the creative process. So obviously if you're in like, I'll speak from a new product development, if you're like in the early stages of new product development, obviously you wanna be floating up in the denominator. You need Absolutely. belief behind the objectives and so forth. And you need a lot of creativity in turning consumer insight into concepts and ideas. You don't want the doubters and um, you know the, the logic folks showing up with the spreadsheets too early, right? Right. So, um, but by the time you get to launch and you're making decisions like, are we going to invest $5 million in a new piece of equipment to make the damn thing? Well, you're going to want more doubt and logic, like healthy doubt and logic, right? Really making sure that, you know, you're ready to, to make that, that leap and in investment. So, so it's really, you know, meant to kind of just illustrate the ecosystem, which is kind of why I called it, you know, the idea climate equation, because it's really about you know, the climate at any particular time in an idea's journey. Well, do you think it creativity frustrates managers or, or anyone kind of leading a department or it, because it's so hard to, to, to track? Like it, it, it really doesn't track well on a spreadsheet, right? Yeah. I mean, the end results once, you know, the idea is out there and it's living and it's, you know, and it's, and, and it's making sales and it's generating revenue. Yeah, then, but the process of getting there really, you know, it, I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's, it's because, and, and thinking doesn't really look like anything, right? <laughs> thinking yep. it, it, that always frustrated me is like, I, I'm sorry. Like it really doesn't look more like work, but you know, I'm sitting at my desk. I, I might have my feet up, you know, yeah. a sketchbook in my lap. It looks like I'm doing nothing, but you know, I'm thinking. Sure. I just think so much of today's world is like, did, nobody wants to think totally. anymore. Everyone just wants to do, just go right to the, you know, no one wants to sketch the designers. They just want to go right to the computer and they want to start designing. It's like, whoa, 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 time out. How about we got to work this out on paper first? Like we got to work out what we're talking about. Like, you know, to your point about the objectives and the strategy and all that stuff has to line up, you know, before anybody starts designing anything. Creativity causes change and nobody likes change. So it's, it's a lot easier to kind of manage things that are known entities and that it feel familiar or we know how to do that. And um, a lot of times a creative idea, you know, the result of that idea is a lot of change. It might mean a delay. It might mean Mm -hmm. more money, you know, and it's just, it's a harder thing to manage. So I think sometimes when you get leaders that are really, uh, you know, I don't want to stereotype, but like maybe like really, uh, high ego, kind of really command and control driven because they, they want to get to the top, right? And nothing's going to get in their way. That um, my experience is it's that kind of leader that's gets frustrated with the person that's, um, you know, always bringing kind of a, like a creative, like, why are we doing it this way? What if we did it this way? You know, why not? all those kind of basic questions. And, um, and to your point, you know, it used to drive me crazy, Bill, when people would like, and we'd have these group review sessions and like, you know, they don't look like they're being productive all the time. And, you know, we didn't, <laughs> mm-hmm. I can tell what's going on in the head there, you know? Right. Right. Well, I have a book for you that I think uh, if you uh-huh. haven't read already, you might want to check out. It's, um, it's a book by Hugh McLeod called ignore everybody <laughs> and 39 other tips to creativity. Um, uh, th- this one, you know, is uh, I've given that like 50 copies of that book away to, to people yeah. over the years. Uh, but one of the things he says is ideas are resisted often because they alter the power balance in relationships. And I think that's to, to yeah, your yeah, point, yeah, right? Yeah, there, yeah. right? And yeah. that goes back to ego and that goes back to vulnerability and being the person that feels like they have to be the one that has all the ideas. And, you know, yeah. I could tell you I've been in sessions like this already where, you um, we got a good idea on the way back from a bad one. You know, mm. someone gave a horrible idea. No one said it was horrible, but it was, we knew it wasn't going to fly, but that became fertilizer that we used for another. It took us in a direction we, we, we hadn't considered mm. initially. And I know um, I've seen that more, more often than, than I can even count the number well, of times. One, yeah. And one of the things I, I try to advise folks is um, especially in new product development, you can be in early on in presenting a concept for that and you have the CFO going, this is like $100 million. My advice in those situations is sell the idea and concept, link it back to consumer, but sell the first step. This is what we need to get started. You know, I need to buy 
a fifteen thousand dollar piece of equipment to prototype. Right mm. so now, I went from like millions down to fifteen thousand, yeah. you know, and then let us do some focus groups, you know. And so, so very quickly, you're going from this down to like, okay, you know, can we budget, you know, seventy five thousand dollars to get this project off the ground? And quite often, if it if the strategy's there and everybody feels like there's alignment, you'll get the approval you need. So, um, so that's often a very helpful tactic is just you know, remember not to get caught up in the glory of the, of the finish line, but to, to really make sure you're selling what you need to do to keep the thing going. I agree hundred percent. I want to know if uh, you can talk a little bit about rationalism versus romanticism. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that came out of the, uh, you know, when I created the idea climate equation and I was kind of studying and reading and trying to kind of add some contextual layer to it way back when in the period of kind of rationalism and romanticism in the rational area, there was this feeling like creativity was a function of a very disciplined to kind of more rational, right? You're looking at things and facts and coming to conclusions and then coming up with, with a solution. Whereas the, in the romantic period, there was almost this like divine kind of uh, spirit to the whole thing that it came, you know, creativity bubbled up from this unknown place and it was almost magical and mystical. And, and I actually think, to be honest, you know, I, you know, I think the, there, it's a little bit of both. Yeah. You know, I think you need to kind of take a very disciplined approach, a very logical approach to understanding a problem and kind of feeding your brain with things directly involved in that problem or things that are unrelated to it, you know, take some time off and maybe let the romantic creativity do its, do its job and kind of connect the dots. You need both of those things at particular times in an idea's journey. Yeah. And I can tell you um, there have been times where I have been, I have felt an inspiration uh, call it the muse, the muses, whatever you want to call them. Um, there have call it Elvis is in the building, riding the wave. But there were times where I felt like I almost what I was creating was not coming from me. I, I have felt that already, Tony. Where and I just my job was to just be the the, the to tr- transcribe what was what was being told to me because I can remember times where I'm writing stuff down, going, "Ooh, that's good." Ooh, yeah. ooh, that's really good. And oh, that's even better. And I'm like, where's this coming from? Because yeah. <laughs> it, it, I, I, I could tell you, I, I was, um, it was for a theater company here the one time. I went and I had lunch with the board, came back to work, did not have time to, to think about the meeting that I just came from, sat down, and it was like something grabbed my hands, put them on the keypad, and wrote this stuff. And I was like, okay, we're doing this? Okay. I didn't have time to do this. And it, it came out of me. And it was amazing. It was this amazing copy about what it means to be in the theater, what it, why it's important, why it matters. And I was just, I read, it, it got done. I was like, whoever just thank you for that, because that was, uh, that was incredible. <laughs> and I did not feel like it came from me. So I don't know. That's the, to me, that's the romanticism side that, that I love. I know logic sits there and well, you know, gets its due, but to me, like, let's, let's dream a little bit in, you know, before we get to the, why it won't work. Yeah. I think we get to, I think we get to why it won't work too fast. That's my opinion. We get that. We go there too fast before we, we fall in yeah. love. You know, right. I had right. somebody tell me once you fall in love with ideas too fast. And I wanted to say, well, at least I'm falling in love with an idea. You know, <laughs> I have that capability, you know, you're, you're going to sit there with analysis paralysis and not pick anything. Yeah. At, least I'm, at least I have the, the courage to kind of fall in love with something that I, that I feel I like can turn into something, yeah. but I would, I, I would argue, Bill, and tell yeah. me if you agree or disagree, but I, I think it's it's probably impossible to get to that state where you feel like there's almost like you, where you that, that you that you just described, mm-hmm. if there's a lot of fear in a culture. So you oh. kind of if you have that kind of really fear based command and control, yeah. you know, afraid to screw up, you know, I, I just don't think your brain and your heart can get to a place where you can even get into that zone because you, you're going to be worried about other stuff. I, I don't know what they teach in business school or leadership school on how to lead teams anymore, obviously, you know, but I just know that it's, it's that to me that, that it's that upside down pyramid. If, if you can get your head around that you're here to support the team as the leader, your, your job is to make sure that 
everyone on your team has all the tools they need to do their job and you're and they know you'll run through a brick wall for them if you if if you have to mm-hmm. that gets returned like it it becomes a, it, it, the trust that's how trust is built that's how camaraderie the collaboration and i'm telling you and i know you know this i'm preaching to the choir here that is truly a magical place to be yeah. when you get into that place there's nothing you can't solve mm-hmm. nothing that you yep. will not be able to tap. Like it is, it, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's what I strive for every day. I try to, I try to get to that place. I don't always make it, but, um, and there's different ways to get there. You know, it doesn't always involve, I think so many, so many times these companies think that, you know, well, we have a foosball table in the break room. That's a creative culture, right? Yeah. <laughs> or like, you know, every, <laughs> or, or whatever kind of, yeah, it's, it's, it's more about, um, setting that that culture for it to grow yeah. for it you you're not creativity is not going to show up in a culture where fear is present toxicity is present you know uh no one trusts each other everyone's looking out for them each other or, or themselves and you know it, it's just not going to grow it's not going to show up it's not going to show up to even start to do its job if you really want to build the trust and respect of the folks on your team you have to demonstrate to them that you're going to stick up for, and defend the idea you can't cave. Yep. Um, and and folks that cave way too soon, they lose a lot of respect, and they mm-hmm. might not realize it. But you know, I, you know, I've been around too many creative people where I hear the chatter after the meetings, and and you know, people yep. just shoot themselves in the foot. And um, all the things that take the product from good to great that we learn through research are taking longer because we don't have the capability to do that yet in our facility. So we need the time mm-hmm. to figure that out and test it and do, do all that work to, 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 to make sure we can add that feature that makes the concept go way up here. Right. And sometimes you'd win, sometimes you lose. And even if you lose, you go back and, you know, the folks like they completely know that you're going to stick your neck out because they're the, the engineers are the ones now, if you lose, that they're going to be working 80 hour weeks trying to get this timeline done. Right. Right. So, right. so if I cave, they're going to be like, you know, F you, Tony, you know, you're ruining, you're, you're going home on the weekend. I'm in here in the weekend trying to figure this out. But if you go to bat and try oh, to fight for it, then, you know, they're going to, they still might complain as I would, but at least they know, you know, it wasn't the team's fault or my fault. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. And, and that's how you build respect and camaraderie and and a culture. You know, those are the things that 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 are needed in a in a culture for creativity to kind of show up and 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 then it starts once you build it and you you can you nurture it, it it goes. It's yeah. like an engine that it's like a perpetual engine. It just keeps going. So yeah. I want to I want to switch gears for a little bit because we're coming up on the hour of our time. Um, so your father, Steve Van Grove, Stephen Van Grove, worked for Saatchi. And I wrote a column for the morning call and I, I, I had a creativity column and it was on leadership and creativity and branding and stuff. And I wrote a column one day that was called be anything but mediocre. Okay. And um, it went into the Sunday paper and um, I was sitting at my son's soccer game and I got a, an email from someone that said, Hey, read your column today. Really enjoyed it. Really liked it. Could have used a guy like you when I was working with, Procter and Gamble and Toyota. And I'm like, <laughs> could he use the guy like me? I get down to the bottom and it says, uh, loved your, loved your column. Uh, Steven Vengrove, uh, former creative director at Saatchi and Saatchi. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what, Wait, <laughs> what? Like, it was like, I had to like walk away from the phone, mm-hmm. take a moment, come back here. He's living in Bethlehem. He's right in my midst. Right. And I, I reached out to him immediately. I said, we need to meet. I said, I don't, we're, I'm coming to your house. You're where we're going to meet somewhere, whatever. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Met him at the hotel Bethlehem. The place was packed. When I walked in, I did a scan of the room and I was like, there he is right there. And I knew I walked right. I never met him before. never saw him. Walked right over to him. We had a three hour lunch. And when we were leaving, we stood in the lobby and um, he shook my hand and he held it a little bit longer than normal. And I was just like, kind of, okay. And go with this. And he looks right at me and he says, you're hired. <laughs> and 
Tony, I yeah. floated out of the Hotel Bethlehem about three feet off the ground. I just floated out. Uh-huh. Like, and we became friends. Um, and I wrote a column about him then, about his time at Saatchi and, and fly fishing. And that's when I met you because I reached out to you for some, some information on, on your dad's history uh, at, at the company. But one of the things that he was involved with was the, the Toyota Oh What a Feeling campaign. Yeah. So I know that you, um, <laughs> you have some stories about that. So especially one where I think, I don't know, did, were, did you take the photo of your dad doing the jump? Was that you? Yeah, I think, yeah, about? that picture you're talking about, I, I yeah, did, and uh, I, I'm proud of it because that was back in the film um, yeah. day, so I kind of nailed that shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's your dad jumping up, like doing the, yeah, like, Toyota, the oh, what a feeling, yep. and, they free, and they freeze. I mean, that thing ran for, I don't know how long, like a decade. Yeah, yeah, yeah long time. And, you know, it was funny because he, he, you know, he would explain that you got to bend your, your lower <laughs> legs back. <laughs> right, um, right. So, you know, he, he had all the, the, the tricks down, but. Well, one of the things I asked him, I said, well, what made you contact me? Like, what, what, what was yeah. it about like the article? And he's like, well, you know, it was, I was, I read it and you, and you stirred up some things in me that, that I thought were kind of, you know, cause he was retired for a bunch of years. And he said, I was walking around the house and I was, I was, I wasn't myself. And his wife, Barbara said to him, what's gotten into you? Like, why are you, you're acting weird. He's like, oh, it's this column I read about be anything but mediocre. And I, I, I don't know. And, and Barbara says, well, we'll reach out to the guy, you know, talk to him. And I, I'm glad he did because it was, um, I am too. We have a and, nice and, little friendship. You know, I mean, you obviously know this, but, uh, you know, I love the story and, you know, he, he thinks the world of you. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, he's like the grandfather I never had, you know, <laughs> I never got to meet any of my grandfathers. He's, I, I consider him like my grandfather. So, but to go back to the, the, the jumps, first of all, you know, he's my most important mentor I've ever had. He was probably devastated when I said I was going into advertising as an account guy, you know, we kind of used to joke about that. Um, (laughs) But, but he, you know, through all the stories and experiences, you know, I got into the business because of him, obviously, but you know, the Toyota stuff, they were the first and only that shot a commercial at the pyramids in Egypt. You know, they, they put a, they, they did a, a Tercel commercial up in Alaska and they put a car on an iceberg and the thing almost tipped over. And, you know, they were scouting in Washington uh, for uh, a location for a, one of the commercials and the, the helicopter pilot like literally flew into the crater of Mount St. Helens, like, I don't know, a few months or a year after the, the explosion, he would come home from these shoots and I'd just be like, you know, I would be completely yeah. enamored by it all. Toyota jump story he once told me, and I'm always wondering if there's a little embellishment here, but this is what he <laughs> told me a long, long time ago. Um, and it comes back to creative leadership and the power of an objective. So yep. So he he joined um, at the time it was called Dancer Fitzgerald Sample before it came Saatchi. And so he got pulled in to the team that was working on uh, the, this kind of new campaign pitch for Toyota kind of came up with, Oh, what a feeling. And they flew out to California and the jump was not in, in the original campaign. Mm. Okay? So when they got to the end, the, the, the senior person said, I love the campaign. I want to proceed. I want to do it. But I have one comment. At the end, you say, Oh, what a feeling. And you're just showing kind of a static shot of the car. It would be great if you could visualize what, Oh, what a feeling feels like. Okay. Think about that. I mean, it's just like he didn't try to solve the problem on the spot. He just laid the objective out. And my dad said, that's a great objective. I get it. I don't have the answer for you right now. But at that time, we had just taken in a stray dog named Kelly. And Kelly was like this whippet, you know, and I, I, I must have been 11, 12 or 13. And I was hell bent on on the fact that Kelly was going to be the next world champion Frisbee dog Bill. Right. Okay. So I had lunch on a Saturday and I go out with Frisbee and I failed epically. I don't know, like on the third toss, I threw it up too high and it came down on an angle and literally hit her in the snout and she kind of yelped. And okay. every toss after that, um, Frisbee had to hit the ground before she would pick it up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was out there for 10 minutes. So, you know, I wasn't ready to go in. So I started to torture the dog by holding the Frisbee up to see how high she would jump. <clears throat> And my father was doing the dishes and he looks out the window and he sees the dog jumping and that's what, oh, what a feeling feels like. Oh my God. Are you kidding me right now? <laughs> that's amazing. So, amazing. so I, you know, th- you know, um, 
and so the thing I love about that, the lesson in that story is, you know, we've talked about it on and off through this conversation is that, you know, a great, um, a great objective was present. Um, the space was created um, for kind of new stimulus to kind of create a kind of a neural connection yep. to come up with a creative solution, you know, and, and, you know, and I've never forgotten that story because I've tried to recreate that off and on because you can tell when people are just, you know, they're too focused on an idea and they're, they got tunnel vision and you have to kind of like let go. Maybe that's why my father loved fly fishing. I love fly fishing. I love yeah. skiing. I love playing the guitar because those are activities that I'm present with the activity. Wow. So I let all the other crap escape for a moment and I create space in my head for new ideas to come in. There's a quote for that. Creativity is not about output. It's about input. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, and that's what your dad had to experience, right? He, he was, he was taking it in. So tell me the story about, uh, about legs and ZZ top. <laughs> my, my sister and I were watching TV. I assume it was probably MTV because that's back when we were younger. That's all we were watching in those days. And, yeah. and it was uh, again, I, I, on a weekend and my father was working unbeknownst to us on a new business pitch. And so he comes running into the, uh, into the family room and he kind of asked my sister, he was like, Hey, Tony, Johnny, I need your help. Are there any songs that are popular right now that are about legs? And we kind of like <laughs> looked at each other and it just so happened at the time, like ZZ tops, she's got legs is probably like in the top five. You know, it's like, you know, if you've heard it a billion times and we're like, uh, she's got legs by ZZ top. Duh. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, ah, and he kind of runs away. And, and like literally a few months later, you know, that was the the song for she's, you know, she's got legs uh, or legs, pantyhose. And so that, that, but that was like the environment, you know, yeah. I grew up, but, you know, I, I often say it's like he made it look easy, right? Cause you, you know, you'd come in and you'd ask the question, you go away and then it's on TV. Right. And then obviously, you know, I don't have to tell you how difficult the whole process is, not just the creative side of it, but the selling side and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Wasn't he in one of the Toyota commercials as a clown? <laughs> yeah. The clown, he, the clown car or whatever it was. And that's yeah, yeah. I found a lot of those old commercials on YouTube. So I've kind of saved You're them. Great. So he, he loves clowns. He's a bit of a clown himself. Theater major, and, right? Wasn't he a theater major? Uh, that was his degree. I think it was writing it but he was okay. involved in in theater stuff yep. but but you know he collected uh clown paintings and stuff he you know there was just kind of a hobby of his so he uh he wrote toyota tercel climbing through muddy dirt roads trying to get to the circus and it's a standard kind of uh clown you know um uh trick where you know they get like 20 clowns and you know in the in the tercel you know it's big spacious car for compact car so uh so they sell the idea and he goes ah wait there's one more thing and he said uh i gotta be in the commercial <laughs> <laughs> and so they agreed to it and he you know he went and uh kind of the the, the clown community created a unique face for him and he was wow. in the passenger seat and he had a line he said you know we're gonna be late and um wow did he get a sag card for that he, he might have, you know, it's funny if you asked him now, he actually, I think he has a little bit of regret because I think he felt like he was taking somebody else's job away. Oh, um, okay. So I think interesting. Um, interesting. he, he, okay. he kind of had that feeling, you know, for years, you know, when he moved out to Detroit to do uh, some work with Plymouth, you know, he would put that clown suit back on and he would march in the Halloween parades and stuff. And, wow. um, and I know he used to keep a red nose, like in his pocket, right? Just yes. to kind of like when things got too serious, I yeah. kind of remembered, hey, we're in advertising, you know, yeah. we're, 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 we're not brain surgeons here. Yeah, he, he, he was, yeah, he was, he's, he's, he's so uh, good at kind of joking around and, and, uh, you know, when, when he knows, you know, the, the room needs to lighten up a little bit, but I just feel but so that the whole red nose thing has turned into, the, the, there's like that whole charity. So there's like that global red nose day. Yes. I, I forget right. what it's, uh, what it raises money for, but like, a, that, that's like a national holiday for him. <laughs> and and at, at, at his 75th birthday, uh, we, there, uh, Barber, uh, did a big party for him and we bought a whole boatload of red noses. So when he came in to the room, Barbara surprised him. Uh, we were all wearing red noses. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm so glad that I was able to meet him and get to know him and through him got to know you and, 
It's just been cool. So I wanted to ask before we wrap up this, uh, your background there, where the location where you're at. Oh, you're yeah. Really cool. Talk, just tell me a little bit about what is that? So I'm at a place called The Silo, which was owned by Ruth and Skitch Henderson. I'm in the museum. Skitch Henderson was the first band leader of The Tonight Show. He founded the New York Pops. If you speak for a long time on all his accomplishments and impact in the world. Uh, my wife was, a, for a period of time, was the executive director here, and I'm still close with the folks that run it today. And so I thought with a seven-month-old puppy and three kids, I just couldn't do something quiet in my house. And there's a whole bunch of cool artifacts here, including the first piano that was ever played on The Tonight Show. Wow, which is, uh, I don't even know what year was that. It's like 62 or something, maybe? I oh, know. I forget. Yeah. It could have even been late fifties, but probably uh, before Carson, right? Before it was Johnny Carson, probably. It was definitely. It was. Uh, I think it was Jack Parr, Steve Allen, then. Yeah. Jack. Okay. Uh, wow. But don't quote me on that. It's a. It's an amazing background. Yeah, well, Tony, cool. listen, I, I I had a blast, man. Like I I, I could talk like for three more hours about this topic, and we would just scratch the surface of creative leadership and. You know, I I just I appreciate you taking the time to come on, share some of these stories. Um, I, I really do appreciate it. I want you to know that. Oh, well, thank you, Bill. It's always a pleasure talking with you. And it's an important topic, and I'm glad it's easy to talk about with you. And hopefully we inspire other people listening to take on that kind of leadership role of inspiring others to be creative. The world needs it right now. More than ever. More than ever, man. Yep. All right, Tony. Thank you, and be well, okay? You too. Thank you for All having right. me on. Yep. Take care. All right, Ad Yakers. Hope you enjoyed it. Because we have many more great conversations planned and guests lined up ready to yak it up. Ad Yak is sponsored and produced by ASR Media. Theme song was written and performed by Dan Ross. Location recording was at JT Norman's Design Studio. Ad Yak is the official podcast of the AAF Greater Lehigh Valley Ad Club. Stay hungry, stay humble. Till next time. This episode of Ad Yak is rated O for, oh man, that was good. <laughs>